Hello, good evening everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this webinar and it's an honor and also a pleasure to announce Shahin Kasali, who is a very well-known and well-respected specialist on endometriosis in England, but he also works in Iran. And um, he's very active, especially in deep endometriosis, and he's pushing forward uh, the borders of endoscopic surgery since many years. And for that reason, he is also a honorary se senior lecturer at the university in London and also is active in the BSGE. And he's also in the advisory board of the EEL. Beside of that, he is very active on neuropelviology, which is a very new field, and it's probably not a field for everyone, but uh, it uh, shows that he is going to the limits. And I know him since many years, and I enjoy his presentations because I feel him very familiar with my philosophy, which makes it very easy to moderate now. And um, I also enjoy his um, type of um, presentation. His um, PowerPoints are very special. And this are, is a bit, bit art. And I believe that art and medicine has many things um, in common. And I believe he's one who knows it very well. So I, I would just want to... Um, um, make free for, for the presentation, but we, he will talk about uh, ureter and endometriosis. And you know, ureter is a very good friend of the gynecologic uh, surgeon. And he will show us to become friend and how to solve all the problems we, will, uh, we have and we have to face during laparoscopic surgery in deep endometriosis. Okay. Shine, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. And now you can start. And I, we, ha we talked about, I talked to Shine, and we said, I will always make some, not always, sometimes I will stop and will ask some questions. And please feel free if you want to see something in detail or you want to have an explanation, please send us a message via the chat room. And we hope we can answer the questions. And um, so, Shine, that's now Thank up you. to you, please. Thank you very much, York. Well, first of all, I'm not just being polite. The honor is mine. I'm truly honored uh, that you are moderating this uh, session. I remember when I was um, uh, just learning how to hold the camera, you were already in the forefront and the cutting edge of endometriosis surgery. And you said that, that our philosophies are similar. That's uh, because I've learned my philosophy from you. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that we, we can speak the same language. And I'm also very grateful um, to EEL. I think this project of webinars have been a great success. And uh, it really is amazing to see that EEL is doing its part in education, particularly in these uh, strange times. And I'm very glad to be part of it. So um, I will try and uh, go through some of these slides quickly because I think it would be much more interesting to, to have a discussion instead of me talking. I have no conflict of interests. And um, um, yes, today I'm going to talk about ureteric endometriosis and in particular management of it. Um, but I will concentrate more on the surgical aspects uh, as opposed to epidemiology and, and the science, uh, and there's a good reason for that, and I will go into that uh, in a second. Um, this is going to be my final slide, uh, but I will also show it at the beginning of my presentation. I think these 10 messages perhaps are relevant to all endometriosis surgery, but in particular, I've modified them for ureteric endometriosis. Um, uh, always rule out hydronephrosis. Uh, remember, silent kidney loss is very important. It does happen. Respect admin tissue and avoid thermal injury. Most nodules are extrinsic and can be excised without reimplantation. Consider preoperative stenting. Um, and uh, the, remember the complementary skills of the team and be prepared. 
and make friends. It was interesting that Jörg used um, uh, the word friends. We will use that a few times um, in this presentation. And always remember that the patient is much more important than our ego. And again, I will explain why I'm mentioning this. So when endometriosis uh, affects the urinary tract, most of the time it affects the bladder um, around 92, 93%, 7% ureter, 2% kidney. But I have a big problem and I uh, don't know if uh, uh, Professor Keckstein will uh, want to um, comment on that, but I don't really understand what ureteric endometriosis is. What do we really mean by ureteric endometriosis? When you look at the literature, you'll see that authors over the years have really meant different things uh, when they talk about ureteric endometriosis. Some um, will call endometriosis that is just over the ureter and on the peritoneum, ureteric endometriosis. The others will only accept ureteric endometriosis if it has caused hydronephrosis. But I think the one that perhaps makes the most sense is uh, when endometriosis is causing compression of the ureter, perhaps encapsulating it. But even that doesn't satisfy me as a, um, as a um, uh, definition. And you see this problem in other areas of endometriosis as well. You know, when we say rectovaginal endometriosis, people mean different things. And that causes a lot of problems when it comes to then discussing epidemiology and research, because it just uh, is not clear what we are actually talking about. But perhaps um, what is relevant is for us to remember that uh, when endometriosis causes compression of the ureter, it can be completely asymptomatic. So don't look for any specific symptoms um, uh, of ureteric endometriosis. And remember that patients can lose kidneys, particularly when um, endometriosis is of a type that does not cause um, major symptoms. And hematuria is very rare. I won't go into diagnosis because, in fact, in my opinion, um, there is no difference uh, in what you can use for ureteric endometriosis. Ultrasound scan, uh, MRI and CT urogram are useful, and that perhaps needs a whole different talk to go into the sensitivity and specificity. Um, and uh, the only thing that I would add here is that there is some evidence that larger nodules um, are more likely to cause compression of the um, ureter. And again, that's not rocket science. We, we sort of know that. Does medical treatment have a role? Well, maybe, particularly in the interim while we're waiting for, uh, for a plan, while the patients are waiting for an operation, or in those group of patients who either do not wish to have surgery or cannot, for whatever reason, have surgery. Um, but um, um, yes, it does have a role, particularly post-operatively. And um, the important thing to remember is um, for endometriosis, really the patient is always at the center of what we do in, in everything, but endometriosis included. Um, but there are three situations in which we... Um, our hands are tied and really surgery will become necessary in most cases. One is suspected malignancy, one is when you have bowel obstruction due to endometriosis, and the third one is ureteric obstruction, because unless we are prepared to put a long-term stent and change the stent, um, uh, the treatment will be surgery. Okay, so... Um, there is, at this slide I quite like um, and I use every opportunity to show um, because I think whatever surgery you do, the fundamentals are the same. With endometriosis, exactly the same story and with ureteric endometriosis even more so. Knowing your anatomy is at the center of it really. Um, having a structured approach always helps. If you do the same thing in the same order all the time, it's not only better for you and your trainees, but the rest of the operating team in theatres, in the operating room, 
will get used to your ways and then you don't even need to talk to each other to to do the next step um, in my opinion optimal exposure ex is extremely important and with your etheric endometriosis even more so your assistant should not really be holding the ovary in my opinion your assistant should have a free hand one hand should be holding the camera the other hand should be free to help you to expose and to keep your operating field dry. Um, for endometriosis surgery and for ureteric endometriosis surgery, especially retroperitoneal dissection, you need to be really friends with retroperitoneum. You need to know it like uh, the way home. This is something that is um, essential. And yes, excise all visible or palp palpable disease. That's something that um, at least I believe in. Um, and your team is in incredibly important, of course. And we will again talk about that. Um, when we say structured approach, this is a mnemonic that we've come up with that we find useful, so sure, uh, which is the um, steps that we always follow in endometriosis surgery. Uh, not all the steps need to be followed in all surgery, but in most, um, we need to do most of the sigmoid mobilization, O for ovarian mobilization, S for suspension of the uterus and the ovaries, U for ureterolysis, rectovaginal and pyorectal space, entry, and then you excise the disease. So the um, principle is that you spend time at the beginning of the operation to maximize your access to prepare the field and before jumping into doing the um, actual excision and removal of the disease there is a lot that needs to be done and that time is time well spent so it always pays off when you um, when you spend some time preparing your operating field so this is not ureter this is bladder but i'm using i'm showing this for a reason this is urethelium, so it's exactly the same. When endometriosis invades into the bladder, it starts from the serosal surface. The same applies to uh, bowel as well. But when it's full thickness, this is the sort of picture that you will see um, here inside the bladder. So another thing that confuses me, and maybe you will have the answer to it, is the um, uh, terminology that we use for ureter um, is different. So we say extrinsic endometriosis and intrinsic endometriosis. But essentially and histologically, it's the same business. So endometriosis has invaded from this other side and when it becomes full thickness, it becomes full thickness. But for ureter, for whatever reason, we tend to call that intrinsic. Um, this is just to demonstrate a simple ureterolysis. So we always uh, lateralize the disease, uh, medialize the disease and lateralize the ureter, uh, paying attention to the ureteric blood supply. So um, you'll see here that the uh, ureter is sliding in within the adventitia. Uh, incredibly important to be careful about the use of heat around the ureter. And that's the reason for it. Although the ureter gets its blood supply from multiple um, arteries directly, starting from renal artery, coming down to the gonadal artery, and then straight from aorta, and then common ilia, up to this point, the blood supply comes from the medial aspect of the ureter. After this, in female uh, patients, we'll have internal iliac, superior vesicle, uterine artery and uh, uh, this is also an incredibly important one because a lot of the time your disease or at least the focus of your disease is very close to the uterine artery and sometimes we have Ahim, to sacrifice may, yes may, yes may i interrupt you yeah Ahim, one question yes do you hear me yes 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 I yes do. um very interesting picture please explain the problem then because you show the, interest, the interesting anastomosis of the um, several arteries coming from the lateral part, mm -hmm. but what happens when the whole uh, area is uh, 
full of endometriosis. Yes, and that's a big problem. That is a nightmare of the endometriosis surgeon. So um, it, it's interesting to see when transplant surgeons take the um, kidney and remove the whole length of 15, 20 centimeters of the ureter with only one artery and nothing happens. But the difference here is that when the area is full of endometriosis and you're using diathermy around it, yes. when you're using, uh, when you're uh, passing the adventitia, then you have completely um, stopped that network. Yes. And that is recipe for fistula formation. That the, is recipe. My question was, it's not the problem of the arteries coming from lateral, it's the longitudinal arteries which, yes. uh, su which supply uh, the tissue there. Exactly. It's very important. And um, I just want to, to make it sure because many people are uh, afraid to free the ureter because of the arteries coming from lateral. But I mm. believe you can free it as long yes. as you leave the adventitia intact. Exactly. And again, the, um, since I've started working with uh, some transplant surgeons, um, um, I've learned that actually these ne this network that runs into the adventitia is very, very rich. So as long as you haven't breached the adventitia, you can get away with, with a lot. And sometimes you have to go from lateral as well. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So this is another... Um, video just showing it. I, by the way, my videos go from uh, basic to advanced. So I will start from disease that is easily taken off the ureter and gradually we'll get to the end where we needed to do boari flaps and you know that sort of thing. So um, here again you see a left hydro um, ureter. Um, the principle is the same. Uh, you just go through uh, the disease slowly, there is no role for uh, speed in this sort of situation. And uh, as far as um, my, my um, take on this is I accept and I tolerate a little bit of blood so that I don't need to use diathermy so much. I let things bleed unless it's a you know, big artery or something that I need to stop. A little bit of oozing, it will always stop we give our patients in this situation one gram of tranexamic acid, and that means that I can make, uh, make uh, use of my dissection a little bit more. And I know, Jörg, that you use, uh, you use uh, infiltration with, um, with um, vasopressin, don't you? Yeah. Yes, uh, what I do is I inject diluted vasopressin, but what is also very helpful, and I can recommend this, to inject saline with a spinal needle into the um, connective tissue. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you get a, a, with the pressure, with the uh, pressure by the water or by the saline, mm -hmm. um, you separate the, the, the um, the tissue and you can follow much easier the ureter. That's just, yes. to, if you are not, if you're not sure, and then you can, um, you make a, a cushion with, with, with uh, water and with saline. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's another case. The, the point I'm making with these first couple of videos um, is that most of the time, you can just use a good, careful ureterolysis, and even when you have hydrourethra, you can get away with it. Um, when you have large endometriomas with uh, with um, uh, mild hydronephrosis, that almost always means uh, that the hydronephrosis is from uh, compression rather than invasion. Although I have seen one or two cases that that wasn't the case. But normally, uh, large uh, endometriomas can be enough to cause mild to moderate hydronephrosis. So I use um, my uh, blunt dissection, but gradually and carefully. And I use uh, for this part, when uterine artery is crossing, I use Maryland. And here you saw how, uh, let me show you that moment again, uh, where the ureter suddenly gets released and comes out. 
you need to have a look at that color. That ureter was a little bit white in that area. So we then come back to it at the end of the procedure to make sure that the color is right, it's working okay. And again, you'll notice that I'm using as little diathermy as possible um, around the ureter. Um, one other technique that we use, and I will show you again here, is I will get my assistant to put the suction irrigation between the ureter and where I am diathermying. And sometimes they um, put some saline around as well. And the hope is, again, we shouldn't rely on this and use lots of diathermy. But the idea is that by doing that, you dissipate a little bit of heat and hopefully will that metal will get the heat and, uh, and spread it. At least that's the idea um, for this. So um, you can use uh, clips around the ureter, although this always worries me that does it get, does it scratch the um, adventitia um, but I'm told by my colleagues who do lots of open surgery around the ureter that that shouldn't be a uh, problem. Um, again, I won't go into this too much, but this is the idea of extrinsic and intrinsic. Uh, one and question. Yeah. Um, um, you, how is your attitude cutting the uterine artery? You did it in that case. Yes. And yes. This is, I think, very important to tell. And the other thing is, do you use a manipulator to have a better access, uterus manipulator to have mm. a better access to yeah. the cardinal ligament? Well, I don't um, use a manipulator, but I instead use uterine suspension. I think you definitely need very good manipulation of the uterus. If you have a good manipulator that can achieve that, perfect. But uh, in my experience, uterine suspension gives me a lot more tension and in a better angle. It's a much more uh, vertical angle. But you, and, have, uh, you cannot change it because when you fix it, that's the fixed position. Especially is, when the uterus yeah. is a big uterus. Yes. And then you have probably, you cannot move it forward and backward, especially and, when, you, when you come close to the bladder. Yes. Um, uh, not exactly. We use two techniques. One is when we bring the um, sutures through the anterior abdominal wall and pull it up. The other technique is I put the suture on the uterine fundus, but then if I need to pull the uterus to right or left, I get my assistant to get a needle holder, get this uh, suture, and then pull it to right or left, and then we pull it up again. Um, I may have a video to show it, yes. but, uh, but you're right, that is a, that is a, a disadvantage. The, but there is a big advantage. You lose your hand. You are losing yes. a hand. Uh, sorry, say that again? You lose one hand. If he has to yes. hold, the yes. assistant holds the uterus, then you lose the assistant. That is correct. Um, what we gain in, uh, instead is that I get my assistant to use a rectal probe uh, okay. quite often. And okay. rectal probe and, uh, and the uterine manipulators sometimes come in okay. the way. But, uh, but there are pros and cons. The and how about the uterine artery? Ah, uterine artery, I have a, and maybe I'm wrong, you correct me, but often your uh, focus of disease is in fact around uterine artery. You need to make a decision. You either leave disease behind or you sacrifice the uterine artery. The literature says that even if you take both uterine arteries, you will have a, you'll be okay even for a pregnancy. Now, I don't recommend it, but um, uterine arteries sometimes have to be sacrificed with ureteric endometriosis. I completely agree. It's very important to free the uterus completely because if you leave tissue behind, you will have the stenosis very soon again. Yes, and, uh, and I will send the patient to you if that happens because I don't want to operate on that patient that I've been no, no, uh, around we, the ureter. Uh, we have to say it because I yes. think you, you showed it very nicely on this video that you freed it completely. Yes, and that's, I think that is also another good point that, uh, um, you, that, that the first surgery is best surgery. 
So going back after you've done a really uh, deep endometriosis surgery and have done urethrolysis can often be very, very difficult. And that is normally when uh, urethetic injuries happen, not in the first surgery. That is uh, really important to get right. This is an interesting one. This shows, shows us how um, the ureter, uh, ureter gets involved in a gradual way. So have a look here. I am using, uh, again, blunt dissection to free up this ureter and see what happens now. Um, this, is, this is exactly at the level you're talking about, you know, the uterine artery level. And you see chocolate material right medial to the ureter and you can see that this in probably one year's time would be that case that would need a reimplantation. In this case, we didn't need to do reimplantation. In fact, we managed to free it up completely. But in a second, you will see branches of uterine artery appearing. And if you are to free up the ureter properly, you really have to uh, free that up and perhaps sacrifice the uterine artery. Otherwise, the disease will very quickly as you correctly say. You can see your uterine artery on the right there. And for whatever reason, there is some research around this, for whatever reason, endometriosis likes uterine artery. This, uh, this is the area that we often see. And you see that I'm using uh, cold scissors. In fact, you most of the time will get away with cold scissors. And again, going back to what you were saying earlier, York, I have uh, release the lateral side of the ureter. Um, the arteries that we're feeding are now gone, but still you have very good color in the, um, in the um, ureter and, uh, and we managed to free it up completely. So this one is again, another case. Um, I think this was, yeah, this was on a lady uh, we recently operated on and we were completely set up for a reimplantation because May I all the... just make a short comment. Yes. It's very yes, nice yes. preparation, and you can explain that you always start in healthy tissue. Yes, absolutely. And it's very important to show on this case, I think. Yes, exactly. You always start in the healthy tissue and then go to the disease. That's a that's a main principle that I, again I think I've learned that from you. Um, so we see the uh, ureter uh, right down here. You can see how the uh, connective tissue over the ureter is very thickened. So we were completely prepared. Can you see the um, uh, suction irrigation mm -hmm. is over the ureter. It's uh, pushing some water and it's also there to, to try and minimize the amount of heat that I'm, uh, I'm uh, pushing into the ureter. So here we thought, okay, there is no way we are going to have to um, have to reimplant this ureter, and this is branch of uterine artery being cut. Again, we can see ureter um, being completely encapsulated. There is um, there is a paper suggesting that um, if endometriosis goes round the ureter 360 degrees, it's around 80 percent likely that it's intrinsic. Maybe it makes sense, but again, I, I really don't uh, uh, understand the terminology uh, much. I'm very confused by, uh, by um, the, some of the made up terminology that is used. Yes, this um, is very important to say. It's, the, it's more the problem of the symptom. And yes. you will probably show finally, then you have to make the decision is the, if after you have freed the ureter, is it uh, good to leave it behind, yes. or is there a risk mm. that there will stay a stenosis? That's exactly. It. But, but in fact, we changed it also in our uh, classification. We don't have any more intrinsic endometriosis on the ureter for the enzyme classification. Only ureter is a dilatation of the and compression. That's that it. makes a lot of sense. That yes. makes a lot of sense. Yes. So uh, it's interesting. The timing of your comment is interesting. This is. Uh, this is what um, uh, we normally do. If you have hydronephrosis, then you need to do a laparoscopy with stenting most of the time. I mean, I'm not talking about the, the um, uh, exceptions. And 
the reason that ureterolysis is green is to make a point that you, even when you have hydronephrosis, a lot of the time you can do ureterolysis. But your point is on this line. Was it a satisfactory end result or is it an unsuccessful or unsatisfactory? What do I mean by that? Do you finish your ureterolysis and look at that and see that actually I've left disease behind? Or that uh, I have used so much diathermy that this uh, ureter is going to um, uh, have a uh, stricture in future. So if you had satisfactory end result, that's fine. You excise your, the rest of the disease, but you make sure that you follow up the patient with ultrasound to make sure they don't develop long-term um, any um, hydronephrosis. If it was unsuccessful, then where is your disease? If it's within the uh, three uh, centimeters, it's a lateral, it's a um, um, uh, distal uh, disease, then you need to do your cystostomy. Personally, I have never done a, a, an end-to-end -end anastomosis and segmental resection of the ureter, but I, uh, it, lots of people have done, and I know that uh, it's successful, but uh, in the patients I've dealt with, I've always either done a ureterolysis or ureteronosystostomy. Um, so it's very important though to follow up the patient with ultrasound scan and urogram. Do you agree your, uh, with the follow-up? Yes, I agree completely, but I'm still doing uh, anastomosis and I, yeah. it is now 25 years ago that I did the first uh, uh, anastomosis in the ureter and we have very good re results. Yes. And yes. I think it's a question also of the collaboration with the urologists because yes. the urologists, they don't like it. Yes. Uh, but um, I think there is a place of a, to make an anastomosis. I think yes. We should no, I agree. It's ju it's just that the patients I've dealt with uh, uh, didn't have the disease on that level, and also you're right. You know, my urologist in my hospital, uh, they when I mentioned uh, end to end anastomosis, the reaction was not very good, um, and it's a problem. And nobody knows why. Yes. There are no data. Yes. Yes. So we have no. I had in my the last twenty five years, I had only one stenosis. Only yeah. one stenosis. Oh, and, and the thing is, you know, what's the big deal? If you get a stenosis, then you go and reimplant, you know. No, so, or you, yeah. make, you make a ureter anoscopy and you cut it. Yes. So, you know, but anyway, maybe. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So this one is another interesting one. This was done with Dr. Araste. So I, I, I have a lovely colleague. Um, in Iran. In, in fact, I haven't been to Iran for the last three years, unfortunately. I miss it, uh, but I used to go quite a lot, four times a year, and we had lots of fun. Um, and uh, I had Dr. Araste, who is a wonderful urologist, who then became a transplant surgeon. So he was always watching me doing these operations, and he was very interested. Here, we were almost doing, we were actually prepared. We said, okay, let's do a reimplantation. And we started cutting the ureter. And then as we are cutting the ureter, we see, oh, maybe the ureter is actually, we can see the adventitia here. You can see the vessels. I know it's adventitia because I can see the, uh, the anastomosis of vessels in there. So in fact, we didn't need to reimplant this ureter and we got away with it. And it amazes me sometimes because I see in the literature, we, we, we are publishing our data on six ureteronosystostomies that we've done. And uh, I was about to publish when I saw something with 150 ureteric reimplantation uh, from a very busy endometriosis surgeon. But I, I really don't see how you can have 150 yes. ureteronosystostomies when you can, even in a case like this, you, if you're a patient, you can um, um, remove the disease without the need for that. But anyway, yes, I completely um, agree. Mm, yeah, but uh, may, maybe their patient group is different. I don't know. So yes, um, just moving on. This this is something that again with Dr. Araste, uh, Heineken Mikulik's um, approach is uh, a bit like our Fenton's procedure. I don't know if uh, you use Fenton's procedure in 
your practice, I haven't done it for a while, but basically is when you have a strictured uh, ureter, one thing you could do, I will just fast forward. So here we have done our ureter lysis, but we see there is disease there. So there is a little bit of disease causing stricture on the left. Uh, sorry, I may first stop the video. Yes, yes. Um, it's very important, it's very interesting on this video to yes. show that you'd have a micro scissor, very small scissors. Yes, yes. And we should say this, that when you work on the, on the ureter, you, you should have a, a scissors which are very small blades, a short yes. blade. Which makes short the blades and the short blades. Exactly. And also the short blades does, uh, does another good thing, and that is um, uh, they're strongest. So for cutting through very yes. fibrotic tissue, you sometimes need very strong scissors. So yes, so here we found that, okay, after we've done our um, ureteric um, dissection, we had still a little bit of um, stricture and uh, we decided, and again, I'm, um, maybe this would be the case that uh, a, an end-to-end -end anastomosis would have been better, uh, but um, uh, we decided to do a, um, a stricturoplasty, meaning making a cut um, uh, vertically, removing the disease, and then closing it horizontally. Yes. Um, so the advantage is that although the disease is gone now, um, we don't have to cut the whole of the ureter, maybe for blood supply, that's better. Uh, again, this patient did well, and you notice that I'm again, um, uh, tolerating a little bit of blood. Blood is good for healing. So I'm not going after um, uh, every single bleeder here and diathermy. I wait a little bit and the bleeding, you see here, I've used no diathermy and the bleeding has over, almost stopped. And then we use a 4-0 suture and, um, and uh, we uh, close this uh, from bottom to top and um, we come out. So this I think is a um, perhaps the most important slide because we may be able to do everything. You know, we may be able to technically do a ureteric reimplantation and a segmental bowel resection, and, and that's fine because as endometriosis surgeons, we are really pelvic surgeons. But the reality is, at least for people who are starting, you're never going to be as good as, say, a transplant surgeon who's putting ureters inside the bladder every day as a job. The same way that, say, a colorectal surgeon may be perfectly okay to do a hysterectomy, but we are the ones who do hysterectomy and then know how to deal with the complications. So, I've always believed that the right approach is a team approach. That's easy to say though, because I'm sure you, you agree that uh, finding the right person is not always easy. You need to find someone who's first interested, that's a big one. And again, with, uh, with a lot of my colleagues, I've been very, very lucky. Um, Dr. Araste, Dr. Lindsay here in the UK, you know, my colorectal colleagues, they are actually genuinely interested. They, they may come and just sit there and watch even if there is, a, there is no case for, for them to get involved in because they want to learn, they want to see. They need to be skilled, experienced, uh, and they need to have an open mind. And the example you gave your end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis is a good one. If you have an open mind as a urologist and think, why am I not happy with that? Only because I wasn't taught or is there a good reason? You have a conversation, you have a debate, you have a discussion, and then you do what's best for the patient. Um, and I think what one, one thing that I've realized is um, sometimes um, um, it's difficult to find a urologist who's very confident in doing reconstructive uh, ureteric surgery because uh, only a small number of urologists do that sort of work. It's, it's the same as looking at endometriosis surgeons and gynecologists. It's like expecting a gynecologist to be able to do advanced endometriosis surgery. So 
But the ones that I found that are very confident in that is transplant surgeons. Transplant surgeons are working with ureters every day. So they, are, they have a different attitude towards working around ureter and uh, reimplanting ureter. And the challenge always is finding someone who is open-minded enough to say, okay, let's put our skills together. You bring the laparoscopic skills to the table and I will bring my experience with, um, with ureters and ureteric reimplantation. And I guide you through this procedure. And if at any point I see that things are not as good as they should be, then we'll stop. I will rush through the next uh, two videos. I only have two more videos and then we can perhaps look at some um, uh, discussion. So this was our very first um, ureteric reimplantation. And I had at this stage not even seen one, let alone do one. But again, I had a colleague um, who was happy to guide me through it. We had a discussion, we read about it. It's so nice cutting the ureter when you're allowed to cut it, um, we, when you know it's okay to cut the ureter. So um, we cut the ureter proximal to the disease, we pass it through uh, under the round ligament. Here we are cutting just the muscularis of the bladder without going into the mucosa. So we wait, we are very, very careful. And then we make a cut in the bladder. We use saline, not uh, methylene blue, because otherwise everywhere will be blue. And then we pass the um, uh, JJ stent into the uh, bladder. And then we use 4O sutures and we do our stitching. It's uh, one thing I learned uh, when I did my first case was, um, well, a couple of things. One was the bladder, despite what I used to think, is actually a very tough uh, muscle. You can um, put uh, big sutures and pull and it will hold, it won't tear. Um, and the second thing I learned is that um, uh, reflux is not a major problem in adults. You know, reflux is a problem in children when you do reimplantations. In adults, what you need to be worried about is having a tension free and here we are doing a psoas hitch so we use a uh, number one bicro to uh, relax the um, uh, reimplantation site um, and this one was an interesting one again with dr araste um, this is a cystoscopy you can't even see where the ureteric ostia is this was a very distal disease which was involving both the distal end of the ureter as well as the bladder. So we had to, you, here's the UO, the guide wire doesn't even go in, let alone a, um, a, a JJ stent. So I will fast forward this. So basically she was also having a hysterectomy. I won't show you that. Maybe this is interesting. This is how that whole nodule looks from the other side. It's nothing. And you know, some people may go and diathermy that, hoping that will, you know, be, but that is the cause of this lady's massive hydronephrosis. So we finished the um, hysterectomy, and then we did our right ureterolysis, and then after closure of the vagina, we completely free up the bladder, then enter the bladder. We free up the bladder so that the um, tissue is uh, free of tension, so that it's floppy. And then when we do our ureteric reimplantation, we don't get um, a tension. And then we do our excision of the deep, the distal end of the ureter with the ureter on block. This is in the other side. So that's the trigone and we can see the other um, JJ stent. And then we use the same hole that we made in the bladder for our reimplantation site. The spatulation is very important. Um, so we make a one, one and a half centimeter cut in the, at six o'clock or 12 o'clock so that uh, the, blood, uh, the ureter end um, uh, is open. Uh, we put the stent now uh, and then we use that hole to reimplant the, um, uh, the ureter. And 
yeah, here is the end result with again psoas hitch. When you put the psoas hitch, you need to be very careful not to get the genital femoral um, nerve inside the um, specimen. And here is the six week um, um, cystoscopy. I will skip that because we're running out of time. Um, and uh, then finally, um, this is a, um, another reimplantation where everything else has failed. So we're cutting the ureter again, not using diathermy, um, massive hydronephrosis, hydrourethra on the right side. This is, I think, from six, seven years ago. Um, we've uh, freed up the bladder completely. But here, it doesn't reach. It's a bit high. The nodule is high. So we cannot reach the bladder without having a lot of tension. So we go and free up a little bit more on the left so that the bladder it can now come up. Um, when we've done that completely, we try again, it still doesn't reach. So now we put our psoas hitch first to bring the bladder closer to us. It still doesn't reach. So here is where uh, we have to do a boari flap. So, and here is where having a robot is quite nice because there is a lot of suturing involved in that. So we cut a flap from the bladder. I think in retrospect, this probably was a little bit of a uh, thin flap. We needed to make it a little bit bigger to have a tension-free flap. Then we inserted a uh, feeding tube, a, a neonatal feeding tube. Um, inside the ureter because uh, we couldn't do that with a, we, we felt that maybe a JJ will not be enough. Maybe again, in retrospect, we could have used a JJ. And then we start reconstructing. It's like plastic surgery. Um, so you basically turn a flap of the bladder into a tube. You suture over it and you suture the end and put the um, uh, ureter uh, right into the end of that tube. Here we are fixing that feeding tube uh, to the bladder and the idea is to then go with the cystoscope and release that and pull it out. And I will just show you the end result. So there's a lot of suturing. I won't bore you with that. Uh, but here's the end result. I think that's an important uh, picture to see that we have the bladder, we have the psoas hitch, and we have the boari flap and then the distal end of the um, ureter. So again, the 10 rules that we have gone through, uh, and I think this is, this is a take home message. And I will finish with this that happened just this afternoon. Uh, it's the 10 second video of uh, a lady I was operating on this very afternoon. Uh, and I had not seen this bilaterally. What do you see? You see double ureter on the left. Very clearly, the, it, this was a hysterectomy for a very large um, uh, uterus, uh, uh, big, big fibroid in a postmenopausal lady who was symptomatic. And then look at this, on the right as well, you have double ureter. So the message is, you know, uh, it's rare, but, uh, uh, I, I knew someone who took three ureters in the same patient, who ligated three ureters in the same patient once. I won't name names, but uh, that can happen. So I thank you very much um, for listening and um, all yours. Shaheen, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture and your very nice uh, videos. And I hope that we have uh, Question, yes, we have questions. Um, I look through it. Um, um, there is a no, there's no question. Uh, no question, but I have, I have a question. Um, you have shown your first case, you said the first case you did with the implantation. You yeah. cut the ureter and you make the implantation very nicely. But this is, uh, the implantation has one problem, but not in your hands, but it could be that many, I, I um, mm, uh, had this experience that uh, urologists are 
doing this implantation and they leave the whole disease behind mm. because they yes. solve the the problem of the ureter and the yeah. kidney is fine but the yeah. patient will still have the endometriosis yeah. and, and for then, that reason yeah. i this is one comment but now yeah. the question is as i see katarina also which is very good how is how is the preoperative assessment mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. location of the stenosis and this um, the size of the ureter and then you can plan which kind of surgery you do. What yes. is your, or how is your setting? So this has changed over the years. Um, I used to do, um, ultrasound is always, in my opinion, the first line uh, for, for uh, any endometriosis. And in fact, ultrasound scan can see the distal end of the ureter and can measure very accurately how far we are from the uh, ureteric um, ostia, it can give us a good idea if, uh, if the uh, stricture is uh, as a result of something external pushing or as a, as a nodule. I also, uh, some of these patients have come from urologists, so some of them, or one or two of them at least, have had ureteroscopies and it showed the blue and black uh, um, spots inside the urethelium. That's also another thing, which again, in bracket, one thing that really is bad uh, that I've seen a couple of times, that sometimes they go and try to laser the endometriosis from inside the ureter. Yes, um, I mean, thinking, is, thinking that- um, that Melting um, the, the tip yes. of the iceberg. Yes. But there's another, I, there's another yes. question. Uh, after surgery, uh, can um, the uh, the bladder effect the bl later on? Will the will the the, uh, the surgery cause pain because of the tension on the on the bladder? Uh, there is no from tension from Anisha. The, yes. So first of all, we use for uh, if she means uh, uh, from the psoas hitch. Um, no, for two reasons. One is that we use uh, uh, absorbable sutures. So it will then, uh, over time, go to where it needs to go. And secondly, we shouldn't forget that bladder is a very stretchable organ. Okay. You know, you can really have very large ureters. So no, no, uh, no but there no, is no, an no. exception. And that is, that is if you have caught the genitofemoral yeah. nerve into, inside the okay. uh, hitch, then yes. So uh, Katarina wants to put, uh, make a no, question. I, you, you, Katarina, no, I, hello. I want to say that um, you know that we are fighting for the, so changing the definition of uh, involving the ureter because it's not only hydronephrosis or hydro yes. ureter, but uh, for the surgeon it's very important if the uterus ureter is involved in the deep endometriosis or not because this makes the surgery much more difficult. So yeah. for me, it's uh, to uh, to see that by ultrasound or by magnetic resonance to understand who that the deep endometriosis is around the ureter despite you have not hydronephrosis yes. and this is the most of the time is mm -hmm. very important so for me you, we have to def, de, change a little bit the definition so hydro ureter is one but the other one is the involvement of the ureter which i think is very important to yes, know before surgery yes completely agree Completely agree. Okay, so there's another, another question by Tana Usta. He asks, um, what do you think about most challenging part of ureteral endo, diagnosis or surgery? Mm. Do you know, the, the, <laughs> I will go even one step back. That's, I don't know what we mean by ureteric endometriosis because we need to ureteralize a lot of our patients, almost all uh, posterior compartment endometriosis is, is that. And, the only difference is uh, when your uh, ureter becomes more involved, the ureterolysis will become more involved. So yes, diagnosis is very easy when you have hydronephrosis, but it's difficult when you don't. Okay, there's another comment. It says maybe the main problem of anastomosis is the location of the nodule. If you have the nodule above the place where the uterine artery cross ureter, it is better to make end to end. Then in mm. case of having, um, 
nodule below. But I believe that, and I could demonstrate it, that you can make anastomosis one and two centimeters from the bladder. It's no problem to make anastomosis there. Mm. It has been shown mm. also by Nejat and by other people. So I'm, I don't believe that it depends on the tension and the length of, of ureter which you have to dissect. Mm. This mm. is the main problem. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't see, as I say, my experience, well, I have no experience with end-to-end -end anastomosis, but I don't see why not. I can't really understand what the, what the issue could be. There's another question. Um, thank you, it's by Wojciech Subert. Thank you for an ex excellent presentation. Can I ask you how approach pre- and post-operative kidney function assessment mm -hmm. and post-operative anastom anastomosis management? Okay, so let me answer that um, in this way. Um, so there was a, um, a slide that I missed. So first of all, it's an incredibly important uh, part of the uh, assessment. Um, for kidney function, we use uh, MAC3 or Renogram, um, which I've learned uh, yesterday stands for mercaptoacetyl triglycerin. Uh, I didn't know what, uh, what MAC3 stood for. And it's a very interesting test because not only it shows you how uh, the balance between the ki two kidneys are in uptake, it also gives you an idea of the, um, of the outlet. So there are three stages, flow, cortical, and clearance. In this one, this is normal. So you see that kidneys are 49% and 51% and there is a good outflow. In this one, the left kidney doesn't have a good outflow, so it's obstructed, uh, but the um, function is the same on both. Here, you see that function is 70%, 30%. So it's an important one because it, first of all, medical legally, it's very important to know what, what your kidney function before you started was. And number two is that if you have no kidney function or very little, I, I think urologists say 10 to 15%. Most urologists would uh, suggest uh, that doing a nephrectomy is the right thing to do um, for these patients. Yes, you know, the problem is that this function shows the distribution between yes. the two kidneys. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's below 15%, mm. Then there is no function at all of the kidney, but yeah. it doesn't say there are some patients they they recover the kidney over the yes. So that case that I showed, uh, the one that uh, we did a Boari flap, in fact was exactly that. Um, have I lost you? No. Um, in fact, it was exactly that. This patient had ten percent function, and uh, we suggested uh, our urology team suggested that she needs a uh, nephrectomy. She said, no, I don't want a nephrectomy. So we did this Boari funk, uh, flap, and uh, uh, maybe if Dr. Aras is here, he can comment, but he, her function recovered, not completely, but it recovered to, to a better uh, place. Which, which what, was, what was the result? Later. I think, I, I, I may not remember exactly, but it was around 20, 25%. It did show that it's now sort of coming to, to life. This, this is a very interesting issue which has not been demonstrated. We should in the future look at this. How is the recovery of these kidneys? Mm -hmm. There is one question. Is it possible to define intrinsic ureter endometriosis? Katarina said yes, it is possible but still a problem when you do ureterenoscopy. I want just to make one comment. I have two patients with a stenosis and, they, and this we have to think about it. Sometimes it's not the endometriosis itself, it's the fibrosis which mm. compresses the, um, the ureter. And there are two cases done by my urologist many years ago. He did a ureterenoscopy and made an longitudinal incision through the whole wall, not during laparoscopic surgery. Just yeah. by ureterenoscopy, put a stent in it, and he waited, and that's it. He okay. just he 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 cut the the ring of fibrosis. But these are selected cases because you don't know if you do only the renoscopy, as you said, you have no idea from the iceberg. You just see the compression or the, the, 
the laser, what they did, this is not very good and we cannot recommend it. I, that what you showed is very good. Let me look for another question. Um, uh, could you give some guidelines when it's better to make end-to-end -end anastomosis than ureter cysto neostomy? So this is a philosophy. Yeah. So yeah. The, the literature, again, uh, says if it's in the last three centimeters, uh, you uh, do a ureter neostomy. It's, if it's above that, do an end-to-end. -end. You and I know that a lot of these are made up. You know, somebody is set in their living room and set three centimeters or four centimeters. Um, I don't know is the answer. I think it's very important to have a tension-free suture line. If you do an anastomosis with three centimeters, normally you can make an anastomosis. If then you have a problem to make a tension-free anastomosis, we do then a momentum flap. Yes, we, yes. we make a flap from the momentum and we wrap the ureter completely yeah. with this flap. This yeah. is what our urologist wanted to, to make us and we had good results with it. Yeah. There's another question. Um, what is your experience regarding the stenosis after end-to-end? -end? My experience is that I had, I have done up to now about 30, 30 to 40 cases, 35 cases, anastomosis, laparoscopic anastomosis, we had one stenosis, one, one stenosis. So how I, long do you follow them up for you? I did the, I did my first in 20, 25 years ago. I won the, yeah. the, the Raoul Palmer prize with this video. Uh, the but, but, but what's your opinion on, you know, when you've done not just end-to-end -end anastomosis, you know, you've done a difficult ureterolysis. Yes. How, how long do you recommend that the patient needs to be followed with an ultrasound scan to make sure there is no I, recurrence? I do in all deep endometriosis, when I see the patients, I do always ultrasound of the kidneys. This is mandatory. I think no, no, for future, I mean after your surgery. Yes, after. I always, when I follow my patients, also ah. with, with bowel resection, I do yes. always kidney uh, okay. ultrasound in all patients. Okay. It's, it's very important, then you will miss it. And I think um, this is what in these patients were missed because they had the hydrophrenosis for many years already and people didn't look at the kidneys. Mm. Yeah. So let's yeah. look what is this, what is the, how do you decide how long you keep the JJ stent after surgery? Okay, well, I, I asked my urologist, but normally, um, if we have done uh, reimplantation, six weeks is, uh, is what we normally do. Um, if we have just done ureterolysis, depending on how bad the disease was, two weeks is normally enough. Okay. So it depends probably how is the tension on your, mm -hmm. on your suture lines. Yes. So another question, instead of doing Boari flap, was it possible to enter to the ratios plane and mm -hmm. liberate the bladder more? Yes, well, we did that. Yes, that's the first, uh, that's the first step. We enter the ratios, we go right down as low as you can really. And that's very important to the other side. So if you're implanting mm -hmm. on the right, it's important to free up the bladder on the left so that you can pull it towards the right. We did That's that, but still comment. it wasn't enough. Yes. There's another comment by Ahmed Kale. Thank you very much. He uh, said to prevent ureteric uh, stricture after end-to-end -end anastomosis, some urologists put allium stent. Mm -hmm. I have no experience, but this is maybe a, a, a additional uh, help. Mm -hmm. How do you decide how long? What is the maximum length? Um, I go through. Uh, Mr. Kirana said, I found laparoscopic blood jets were very helpful, atraumatic instrument for ureterolysis with ureteric nodules. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, use, uh, we use tonsil swabs sometimes. Okay. Um, I get, again, this is theoretical, but I sometimes think that if we can avoid any fiber that stays in the body, because even with pledgets and uh, swabs, you sometimes leave microscopic 
little things that then may cause uh, more fibrosis, but I don't know. It's only theoretical. So um, another the Luca Matak, this was the question, give you some guidelines when it's better to make end-to-end -end than ureter cystoneostomy. So I think it also depends on your urolo urologist. I try to avoid the implantation. Uh, that's because it's also very, um, you have to be more mobilized, the bladder and so on, and if it's possible, but if not, I, it depends also if you have a good urologist beside your side and he is following your ideas. Uh, this, you experience is probably your urologist is more likely to use, uh, to take, uh, to make a... Uh, no, in fact, that has, you know, it's good you asked this question. In the last year, Jörg, um, I had three patients or maybe four, four patients where we had completely prepared and set up for reimplantation, and in all four of them we didn't need to okay no so so the um the message is that maybe i'm getting better at my ureterolysis i don't know but um the urologists and the uh, transplant surgeons i work with are actually very um logical in that and they always um, look at that and say okay no actually we don't need to do your uh, reimplantation let's see if we can get away with it i think you made it very clear that the message is first of all look if you need any surgery on the ureter itself it's yes. to free the ureter, ureter itself and to make it mobile and to remove all pathologic tissue around the ureter this That's is right. the first step and right. you are right, this publication with 160 um, implantation, this is something very, for me, very strange. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it looks like, if I have an, an, uh, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I mean, this is, yeah. we shouldn't be aware that yeah. not doing surgery sometimes is also good. I mean, but the ureter is a very, very um, sophisticated and a very delicate, uh, organ and you don't have several chances you have to make it clear and very safe I so i look if there's some um dr kekstein yes. hello we are in 70 minutes now yes okay uh, uh, i just look to uh, if there is some uh, uh question and then we stop it uh, uh, the last question is here. Are they okay? There's no question here for us. Okay, so um, that's. I just want to say thank you, Engin, inviting me as a moderator. Thank you, Shahin, that I can moderate you, and uh, I enjoyed your lecture. And I hope all the participants they had also fun and. Um, um, that it's very important. This is an activity of the EEL and I hope that we will have some more members for our society, which is very important to support the, uh, these kind of activities and the future. And we hope that next year mm. for the, but you, Engin, you will say something yeah. about the Congress, I'm sure. Yeah. So and I just wanted to say the same. First of all, as I said in the beginning, it was a great honor to have you moderating. I always enjoy uh, having these discussions with you and, uh, and I hope that we can meet face to face. And I want to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Oral and the rest of the EEL family. This is a really good um, um, uh, project and it has worked very well. And I really congratulate you and I'm very glad to be part of it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Fantastic lecture and fantastic moderator. It was so didactive and instructive. It was so amazing. Thank you so much. You. On behalf of the EL board members, just three things I would like to say. The first one, next webinar will be next month, 15 of December, about the adolescent endometriosis by Dr. Saladan from UK. And the second one, there will be, there will be uh, our Congress uh, next year, hopefully, as a face-to-face -face on December, uh, the chairman will be Dr. Haros Raman, which is who is 
our board member in France, and the third one, and uh, our super uh, project masterclass from the EAL. It will be next year. Hopefully, it will start at the six different cities by the presence of the Dr. Hal Crandall in the different European cities as a face-to-face. -face. Thank you so much for tonight. It was so, so good for us. Thank you so much. See you in the next webinar. Thank, Thank you, you, my friends. Great Thank discussion. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Earl. Thank you, Shaheen. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. You. See you. Bye-bye. 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 Edin, thank you for the help. Thank you, thank you so much. You are